I want to talk a little bit about Song of America, their project we did, mm -hmm. uh, and confess some of the mutations we had. Yeah. Okay, we are on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is Thursday, so it must be Thursdays with Thomas. This is Idajo Live, the place where classical music happens. And I cannot tell you how a more happening place, not just because of these wonderful two young people looking at you on the screen, but this woman is one of the most exciting composers of our time and of her generation, our generation. So when we say classical music happens, we're talking about seriously happening pen to paper amazing and you won't believe it but this guy is not her driver he's her librettist he writes books he writes words he is an amazing we worked on a fantastic project called song of america beyond liberty a, a couple of years ago we launched and i went around uh, in several cities with it and these two people actually have names and they are missy mazzoli and royce vavrick Welcome. Great to see you guys. Royce, we haven't seen each other for ages. It's been way, way, way too long. This is so awesome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us on. And any of you classical music lovers and opera music lovers, you are looking at the Pulitzer, -wise, Pul Pulitzer Prize winning team. I'm sorry, she gets all the credit as much as you do, dear boy, for breaking waves, right? Isn't that what you got oh. for? No, no well, we, we won a big award for Breaking the Ways, but not okay, the whole time. Tell me all about it. I've screwed up. <laughs> tell me, tell um, so me what, what. Yeah, so Breaking the Waves uh, premiered at Opera Philadelphia in 2016 right. and was awarded the Music Critics Association of North America's Best New Opera Prize. Um, and it was the inaugural prize. Uh, the music critics of this continent decided that there needed to be an award. There, there just there isn't that much. Uh, in the lines of opera. There are tons right. of theater awards, tons of music awards, but um, but classical music and opera are neglected. And so they created this prize and we were very, very fortunate to be the first winners. Uh, and we got to travel to um, Santa Fe okay. to collect the prize. And uh, it was one of the highlights of, of the life of Breaking the Waves. And now Breaking the Waves is having a crazy life, uh, which uh, it's traveling all over the world. We just did it in Scotland. It went to the Adelaide Festival. Um, it was supposed to come to BAM, uh, which was canceled, a, a BAM Met uh, co-production. Uh, that's, that's the Brooklyn Academy of Music and the Metropolitan yeah. Opera? Yes. Ah, what, did they postpone it? Will they bring it back? Is it going to be... Last, no. No. It was canceled. Just canceled. canceled. Yeah. yeah. But there is light at the end of the tunnel in that we do have a Metropolitan Opera commission that will happen in the coming years. And uh, Breaking the Ways is scheduled to play Houston Grand Opera Los Angeles Opera and a, a European house that will be announced in the future. <clears throat> well, I was going to say, Breaking the Ways actually has traction over here. People know of this piece. Why is that over here in Europe? And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm in Zurich and they're in Brooklyn. And that's the miracle of, of Zoom and Idajo Love. And it's, it's, this is such a wonderful project. We started a couple of months ago, Idajo Live. I can have conversations with all my favorite people. Uh, and, 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 and it really is the structure is, you know, drop by, have a drink, because I know you got something else to do in the evening, is if, <laughs> is, as if that were our lives right now. But nevertheless, so why, does, why is Breaking the Waves, why does it have traction over here in people's minds? Is it in England? Has it come to England? No, it had its European debut in Scotland. So that's been the only uh, performance outside of America. So it performed- No, uh, Adelaide as well. Oh, in Adelaide, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, right. The only performance in Europe um, was in, in in Scotland and in part of the Edinburgh Festival last summer. But you know, it's you know it's based on the film, the 1996 film by Lars von Trier, um, which is very well known. Um, and people, even if you hadn't seen the film, a lot of people know of the film or know of Lars von Trier's work. And so there's a way into that opera. Um, and you know, I I think it's good. I, I spent it took me like year, it took me over three years to write it, and um, and I really was I feel like of all the pieces I've ever written, that really represents who I am as an artist. Um, and so I'm thrilled that people responded in that in that in the way that they did. It's, it's a provocative film that I I saw when I was 14 years old, and it is something that I've carried with me narratively, and have always wanted to. Uh, be in dialogue with it in a, a more dynamic way. And so when I was able to convince Missy to uh, to write it with me, it was a dream come true. And similarly, it feels like sort of one of the the, the most uh, whole examples of my artistic voice. Um, and uh, and to do that with Missy and to, to share um, in the creation of this has just been a, a whirlwind of excitement. 
I get it. And, and, and we're having this wonderful conversation. Let's just take one step back and, and each of you, I'm going to separate you, out, separate you out here. Bring us up to this moment individually. Royce, you first. Where are you, where are you from? Where did you study? How, did you, how, many, how many books have you written? How many librettos have you written? How many projects do you have? And, and try and keep it in the TV guide kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we share a similar um, geographical origin in the sense that I'm from Northwestern Canada. Right. Um, and so uh, I come from a farm. Uh, and I grew up, my father and mother uh, farmed wheat, barley, and canola, and I sort of came from a, a group of cowboys, and opera was not something that we listened to. Our radio was was country music 24-7, uh, um, and my mom loved to leave the radio on so that when we came home from school that it felt like there was uh, life in the house, but it was always country music. And uh, opera, for me, represented something that was super... Um, a high art and it was elitist and I it represented everything that my farm um, childhood was not and I wanted that so badly which is funny because now opera represents something that is for everyone to me and I, I rally against this notion that it is an elitist form. Did you uh, guys get the did you have the Texaco broadcasts up there? Did they go to Canada I, back in the day? No, I don't think so. I, I'm not I sure what. I never listened to him as a kid either. We're, we have very similar backgrounds. Never mind. Anyway, yeah. Keep going. Yeah. And so I um, I ran away to Montreal uh, immediately after I graduated high school to study filmmaking and creative writing at Concordia University. And then immediately after that four years, I came to New York and did my master's degree in musical theater writing. And but you're also uh, a musician, no? Um, well, I studied classical voice, piano. I was in a choir. Uh, I took theory lessons. Um, it, so I had musical theater. I had all of that. And I, so I, I love art song. And I think that we have so many similarities, Tom. Um, well, that's and, why we wrote the script. <laughs> and I am a, oh, oh, I was a that. soprano and a boy baritone. So we're, we're basically the same person. <laughs> Man child. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And and so came to New York, to New York University, and you've kind of been in New York ever since, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I moved here in 2005, so it's nearly 15 years. This summer it will be 15 years. Fantastic. But you're still, sorry, it's nobody's business, but I mean, but you're, but you're still Canadian. Yes. Proudly so. Exactly. And rightfully so. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about, we're, I'm going to go from that to, to just a little bit about our work together on Song of America, but Missy, please, wh where, where, you just sort of, in my consciousness, just sort of appeared in sort of an amazing, have you heard of this woman? And I know, and then I heard your music and just kind of went, where did this come from? Who is she? This is not amazing stuff. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, um, did, did not come out of nowhere. I came from Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, and um, sometimes feels like nowhere. But um, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. And uh, like Royce, you know, did not have a very sort of musical. Well, my your family was kind of was musical, at least, you know, my family was not musical at all. And um, so anything sort of anything that had to do with music or any, especially anything sort of like high art, I hate that term, but you know, opera, orchest orchestral music, um, was felt so far away. And I actually got into music and opera in particular through music videos and through popular music. Um, I played piano and really fell in love with it. And it just, all of that together just opened this world for me. Um, and for me, you know, being a composer really works because I have so many other interests. You know, I'm interested in visual art, poetry, philosophy, theater, um, everything. And so as a composer, you get to do a little bit of everything. And so in looking back at all that now, having written four operas, working on our fifth, you know, it's, um, it all kind of makes sense. But at the time it was just like, how can I enter a field that allows me to access all these different worlds? And when you say music videos, you mean, you mean like VH1 stuff? Yeah, MTV, VH1, I would watch it for like three or four hours a day. Um, and it was just like this porthole to this world. And, and, and at the time, you know, MTV and VH1, it was weird. You know, yeah. it was like, um, I'd watch it late at night and it was this like free form kind of almost like performance art style when no one really had defined what it was supposed to be. And I loved it. And I thought this is like, you know, later on I learned the word Gesamtkunstwerk and it's like, this is, this is everything. Everything is in this art form. <laughs> I remember conversations, you know, back in the day where, you know, how do we do this for the classical idiom? 
and mm-hmm. and of course the problem with classical music the minute you start putting pictures up you're kind of telling people what to think about and that that becomes a big issue for for composers and and performers alike and it's 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 a, it's a tough time to go i never got into the music video thing i i respected the the power of it the ones that caught my imagination were just because of the enormous incredible high production values that they could that they could put it in i was i was more, my passion really was you know when when ken burns whom we all love mm-hmm. uh you know when of course the civil war was amazing and and jay unger and his uh, ashokan farewell jay unger and i did the the, the stephen foster album together which was a, a lot of fun and and uh, you know cleo lane and her husband actually went back and wrote words for the melody uh which i re- recorded but the point what i'm going to make was that you know, then then Ken went on and he made you know the history of jazz, which was a phenomenal series, and Martin and, and Winton was sort of the core of that. And just of late, I don't know if you guys have had a chance, but I mean, you would laugh, Royce, but his history of of country western music is just bloody genius. I mean, it is just hey. fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's just feel good, smile. I knew everybody. Some of the connective stuff, I went, oh, I didn't realize that. You know, it was really fantastic, but. So my feeling about video and music video was, how do we do, how do we tell that story for the history of classical music, especially in America? Because my passion has always been that, that, the, that the classical music idiom in America, and especially the vocal music and precisely the song, poetry and music, is a kind of diary of our, of our American culture. You can, you can tell stories. And of course, that's what what you know i was i was after you and we spent hours and hours and hours and you wrote the script and we revised it and rehearsed it missy as you listen to me talk about song of america and how i see american culture and true and feel free to disagree but does that does it make sense to you what i'm saying does that does it feel like a like a right connective material or a, a tissue to to the dna of american culture absolutely yeah Good. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Checks in the mail. Uh, no, but I mean, but but and and I want to go on to this farther with the, with the, with the both of you. First, I want to listen to some music, and I'm and it's my it's my I dodge your learning moment. Uh, but hold hold that thought because we live in extraordinarily volatile times right now, and I've had a lot of wonderful African American colleagues on on this and also the Facebook program and Amazon Foundation trying to, well, not trying to, literally galvanizing all of us that if we are going to move the dial forward, it is going to be through education. It is going to be through sharing poetry and musical moments with one another and, and even farther than what we have before. But we'll, we'll get to that. Because you've spoken of your music, I, I want to, uh, and this is this is this is my share my screen sharing moment, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to take you to, uh, I'm going to take you to the Idajo app, which I really love to do, uh, because a lot of you don't know how it works. Now, this is the splash page. Are you seeing this, by the way? We are. So That's this great. is. The, I've just opened it. This is literally discovered. This is if, and this is the app. Now, the app that you can have on your computer as well as your iPhone, as well as your iPad and Android, whatever that is, is the same as your browser. So the point is when you're in the iDodger world, everything functions the same. One of the one of the really wonderful things I love about iDodger is that you can make playlists and the playlists that you make anywhere follow you anywhere. So you can just go through and pick out, oh, I wanna carry this and that with me all day long on my iPhone or whatever else. And it's all streamed at a very high quality and it stays in your ears. And I remember having, I was streaming once with, with iDodger and I, I was in Paris working at the opera and I went into the Metro and of course it broke off. And I thought, okay, so we got to the Metro, literally 20 minutes later came out of the Metro picked up exactly where I had left off and went on for that. So kudos, kudos to Adagio. But if you went here, what if you went, for instance, if we if we did this Bach, well, actually, I rather like this. I, I, Wayne Marshall and Gershwin just sounds like too much fun. Uh, <laughs> these, the ellipse will let you save to a collection or save to a playlist. I'll show you that later. If we go here, one of the really cool things is, this is, you get a bit more information now. If you play from here, this cut, Once it loads, here we go. Come along, play. Come on, play. You can do it. There. Now, 
Ah, it didn't do it for me because we don't have any of this. We're going to go back here. Never mind. Uh, what happens is on this side, you get all the other recordings in the Adagio catalog of that, but I will not waste my time with that. I made a playlist called uh, Miss and Missy. And <laughs> I have here, these are various things here. And I, I want you to know that I think this is one of the most beautiful pieces of music I've heard in a long time. Vespers from oh, Violet. When, when did you write this? So I wrote that in 2015. Um, it was recorded in 2018 by Olivia De Prado, violinist. And if you want to hear about, about awards, um, we got to go to the Grammys because Missy was nominated for this track for oh Best Contemporary God, really? Classical Music. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, nobody called me. It's all at my. Let's, can, ladies and gentlemen, let's just have a listen to Miss Mazzoli, please. to do this but this isn't a rave i have to i have to stop over there it felt like i came to some some sort of returning center of tonality i hate to do that to people by the way this playlist is is on your your youtube if you're watching this on the youtube live or on the i dodger the playlist we've put together is mostly of of missy's work and then a couple of other songs that that hopefully will will illuminate this pre-july 4 uh, celebration and talk of music. Let me come out of the Adagio app. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't really do this very well. Let me let, let, if, I, if I pick a more, this might work. If I pick a more, for instance, here, I just want to show you how this works. So I'm going to put, I'm, if, I, if I launch this here and it's going to play that, you see what happens on this side of the screen? That is every other recording in the Adagio database of this specific cantata of Bach. And you can imagine, you know, for instance, if you're doing this with Mahler symphonies or Schubert symphonies or any of other symphonies and quite a bit of American music, this is not going to happen with you, Missy, because <laughs> you don't, you know, you're original, your, your piece is a singular, but this is one of the, one of the really quite in innovative exchange of data information on, on the Adagio app, which I think is quite, quite fun if you want to compare but also if you want to just spread your fingers if if you like this maybe you'll like that that's one of my one of my absolute uh, mottos in in programming music i'm going to stop sharing and come back to just us um you have i mean i could play so many different examples and i remember uh, what was the piece that i came when i saw in washington that was the that's the opera you just recorded right yes proving up yeah and I remember thinking, wow, what a fantastic movement. It was one of the, and when we, when it was a dress rehearsal or, or one of the late rehearsals, and I walked down to the pit and there were what, 16 guitars? <laughs> Seven. Flat on their back. But they felt like 40. Specific, specific, <laughs> specific, 
Tell me about that. Yeah, so this opera, uh, it's called Proving Up, and we wrote it in 2018. It premiered uh, January of 2018 at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., um, and it uh, is based on a short story by Karen Russell, the American writer. Um, it's a story of homesteaders uh, who are, it's a fictional story of homesteaders who are going to Nebraska from Pennsylvania to take advantage of the Homestead Act in 1862. So um, I want, I, when I was thinking of the orchestration and the general sound world of these people, I was imagining a couple things, you know, first of all, what is this, what are the, the instruments that they would have possibly taken with them in their covered wagon going across America? Um, so guitars, harmonicas, um, you know, kind of junk metal things. Like these are things that they could have possibly had around them. Um, and so once I had the idea for one guitar, I thought, okay, I think I need a lot of guitars. Um, because the, the way it works is that there it's seven acoustic guitars hanging um, or laying down in the percussion section and they're played by the percussionist and the percussionist hits them with sticks, uh, sometimes strums them, but mostly it's just kind of this open rattling sound. So you have to tune all of them to different chords. Um, so you have the option of seven available chords. Um, I remember so looking. That, I remember looking down there and seeing his stickies on each one of them. Yeah, so like D the, major, you know, or like chord number seven. Yeah, it's um, yeah, and it, it's it's tricky. But I love the sound. Where does this come from? Well, it's it's the sound. It's also the sound of their environment. You know, they were. The, the story takes place the, during the idea a of these different tuned guitars. Have has that ever been done before? I'm and I'm sure people people have played guitars like that. Uh, in pieces before, um, but I don't know. I, I'd never seen seven in an opera pit, um, and I thought that would be really cool. Not, you know, not only sonically but visually. But see, this is something. This is something. If I, if I was if I was going when I when I talk about your music and the limited that I I mean I know some but not uh, this amazing sense of or or surgery sense is such a ridiculous word, but. You have such a, a palette of colors and sound and textures in your in your music and and mm -hmm. the use of of interest instruments in unusual ways and it's not gimmickry it's it's like what we we're just listening to of course it's this wonderful violin ostinato obligato whatever it might be this wonderfully personal expression but this but this world, you know, I, f I find like listening to your your orchestra pieces and, and on this playlist, I'm sure ladies and gentlemen will agree with me, one just sinks into a different tonal focus. And this is and this is really quite remarkable. And and I, I remember it that and, and Royce and I talked about this at some extent when we were at Glimmerglass about your music at the rehearsal, because it was the first time I'd heard a piece live and, and the opera that you were able to capture that in in the operatic realm and yet protect the integrity of the voices and the text the communication of their characters in that this is quite i guess i guess that's why you're getting all the awards but i mean <laughs> I, I, I i mean this just you know okay i'm done you talk <laughs> well, it's interesting because you um the, the job of the operatic composer is equally like yes you have to compose the music but you have to be a dramatist you have to really be invested in telling the story and i think that that's you know I, you see a lot of composers wanting to write opera and i think that there are there are so many beautiful composers out there but um there is a rarefied group that i think really can bite into the dramatic necessities um, and the dramatic requirements of what music needs to do in order to tell stories. And there are a million different ways that you can use music to set text or not set text or or to you know communicate something. But uh, opera is a very specific thing and Missy just has this unbelievable- um, how, how did you guys story. meet? How did you guys meet? What happened? Oh, at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> of course, of course, where else, right? I had a premiere uh, with our dear um, colleague and a, a beautiful collaborator of mine, David T. Little, and Missy came to see that. Uh, it was the a 20 minute sample of what would become my opera Dog Days, which was one of my, my initial successes with Song from the Uproar with Missy uh, in 2012. Right. And Missy came up to me with a flyer for a sort of prototype a version of her opera Song from the Uproar. And she asked me if I'd come, which I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a couple months later, she asked me to complete the opera. So it uh, it all stems from this- so the, um, the word, To complete the libretto. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. That would have been yeah. messy. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you read a lot? I mean, is that one of your 
I mean, you read plays and librettos and books, and I mean, you're you're looking for people that know how to to write. Is that true? Yeah, I think. Which you, one about you see? Oh, you, yeah. yeah. You know, um, I um realized really early on when getting into opera that you had to. I, I felt that as a composer, I had to be very knowledgeable of what was going on in the theater world. Um. And so hanging out with Royce and also all these directors who were friends with like James Dara, Thaddeus Strasberger, like these people, um, Robert Woodruff, you know, they're um, like, they're always, they had a language about plays and, and theater and from old to new. And I was like, I really need to like brush up on this because that was not something that I learned studying music composition in a conservatory, but it was something that felt very essential if I was going to write opera, I had to have a common language with them. So I really immersed myself in theater and plays and read a lot of plays, read a lot of libretti, um, saw a lot of plays. We go to see stuff. Well, and when we're allowed to, when things are open, we go to see stuff all the time. Um, but we've also been watching a lot of movies and trying to catch mm -hmm. up and have communal, um, just movie watching experiences in our living room so that we have that arsenal of, of narrative. I mean, um, you guys, you've actually been locked down together yeah. this, this last spring, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yeah. Missy, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> well, I think that's the other thing is that like we're we're best friends and we talk every day, whether it's about music or not. We go on vacation together, we hang out together. So it's like, I think that that really is one of the other keys to our success as a collaborative pair is that we're in constant communication. And the, there's so many times when we'll be in like the back of a taxi, you know, like going home late at night and like, we'll be like, oh, what if in that one piece this person repeated that word over and over again. And just these ideas come out of nowhere. And since we're often together or in communication, it's it's a very robust, alive collaboration. Yeah, I keep thinking about how much work gets done in the strangest of places. And like, I, I remember I was just in Beijing like eight months ago, six months ago to for Angel's Bone, which, which is a piece that uh, did win the Pulitzer uh, with Du Yun. Um, and uh, I was in the back of a cab with the producer Beth Morrison. And we had a like 50 minute car ride through the streets of Beijing where we talked about work and, and just what we're going to do and all these. And like, so, so many things happen in these, you know, in the back of the cab or um, while you're waiting for a movie to start at the local cinema. When yeah, but what movie... I loved about work, our work together, I mean, we spent an awful lot of time together and, and a lot of it was me, was me um, regaling you with, with a very personal narration of, of American history through American song repertoire. But once we started, you know, text smithying, uh, and and even I remember the rehearsal period. When, you know, because obviously the script had gone through a lot of mutations, and we had time limitations. We had a song list that we needed to get through, all that kind of stuff to make it a show. And of course, then, you know, Francesca Zambello came in, and and she's a, you know a wonderful producer, and kind of cut right through all the nonsense and said we need to go here. It was interesting afterwards. You know, there was uh, Francesca and I. I'm a devoted to her. I love her dearly. I think there was there was at some point where her show and my show were not like the, not the same essential take, but that's because I I believed in I believed in some pretty corny music, and she just knew that that would slow us down. But what I really want to talk about, because I trust her completely, what I really wanted to say was that as we started really as I started really getting these phrases in my mouth and and start getting our preambles and postambles to the songs lined up with the text of the songs. It was remarkable to me, remarkable to me how one, how flexible you were, how how interested in, oh yeah, you could, yeah, we can say that. And for me, of course, the problem was we always say, okay, you can say that, but you got to keep saying that. Because <laughs> I, I tend to riff a lot. Uh, and and so, you know, sort of nailing me down to proper English, even American English, uh, but, but staying on it. But you seem to just have this, fascinating fascination in text of how people can say things is that yeah, my, it was also right? important for me to create a show with you that really celebrated your singular the, the prism of tom hampson and what that what your relationship was because i think that people wanted to hear and want to hear about your these anecdotes about uh, how this music has affected you and where you found things and that beautiful abraham lincoln story and the amazing story of you on the train um, when uh, JFK was assassinated. Mm. Um, and like all these beautiful things. And, and I, it was really just, um, we had 90 minutes and we wanted to tell as many stories and to give this portrait 
of America through song. Uh, and so it really was like a year and a half of whittling away because we could write 85 concerts um, and still have fodder for more. And I remember sitting with you in Paris and uh, we were like, well, we could do a show about baseball. We could literally do a whole thing about baseball or a whole thing about I don't know Christmas trees. One of the original <laughs> ideas, because I kept talking about Walt Whitman, and and then and then I and then and then Francesca focused in on the fact that my first name is actually Walter, and she said, "That's it. It's Walt. It's Walt having a conversation with Walt. You're Walt. It's going to take you to Walt." And actually, I must say, uh, my the next mutation uh, of of Song of America, I, I think I would like to go back to one of our original ideas of of Walt Whitman and Mark Twain having a glass of bourbon and a cigar with each other uh so here's a question for you i've you also come across some, one i tell you i've come across some absolutely amazing connectivities of these of these lives and and the and i mean did you know did you, did you know that charles ives wife name was believe it or not harmony her name was <laughs> harmony twitchell and her father was the man that married mark twain and christened their children, and buried their children as they did, and and buried uh, uh, Lily. I think was Mark Twain's wife's name. The Twitchell family is this is this fulcrum between the Ives and the Twains, and of course Walt was this huge, you know, figure uh, in 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 the literary context. I mean, can you? But I mean, it's, it, I just kind of. You know, and over here, by the way, one of the places we like to hike in Switzerland is a place called Rigi Mountain, which is R I G I. It's next to Lucerne, so okay. we drive up there, and you can. It's quite a climb, and it's yeah, quite a climb. It's a wonderful place, one of the great natural places to go wandering here in Switzerland. So we're going up. We got lost, and finally we just parked the car and said, "Oh, the hell with it. Let's just go. Let's just take this trail up from this side of the of the Rigi because you can go up on different places." So we're going up the trail, and all of a sudden I see this plaque. And I get to the plaque, and I look at it, I read the plaque, and I said, Andrea, you're not going to believe this. It is a Mark Twain, when he was doing Innocence Abroad, no, uh, the, uh, the Tramp, Tramp Abroad. Innocence Abroad is, is, uh, is, um, is um, not Washington Irving, it's um, uh, 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 um, the, big, uh, the big family. Ah, God, I'll get it. Um, James, right. Okay, but the tramp abroad is is Mark Twain when he did his face. And by the way, on that trip is Harmony Twitchell's father. And it was after that trip that he finally said to Harmony, "Well, if you can put up with him, we can put up with him." I mean, because she said no to him for marriage like for three years, and finally, because she was just like this, and Mark was Mark. Well, Sam Samuel Clemens was all over the map, and Mark Twain was this sort of you know ventriloquist figure. It's an amazing thing. He climbed the Rigi Mountain. And so we followed this path serendipitously, completely out of nowhere, one, one Sunday afternoon up the side of Rigi. And I'm just walking where Mark Twain went up the hill when he climbed Rigi. I mean, I mean, get you out of here. You believe in reincarnation <laughs> because this is uncanny. <laughs> well, if I did, I want to come back as Oscar Peterson. So that's another conversation. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, this is. Uh, I, I had other questions for Song of America, but let's get back to America now. This is this is this is a completely unusual pre-July four. July four is a big celebration for us in America. It's going to be a big celebration, or at least a lot of awareness, a lot of tension this year as well. We we have we don't you know we've got this perfect storm of a pandemic, financial meltdown, and racial unrest like we haven't seen since the late 60s. And I'm the only one in the room that remembers that. It, uh, you know, it's, and we have this glorious recognition, finally, and of, of the African-American classical music canon uh, which the canon of African-American music in general is a, is a needs to be far more fleshed out and explored and loved and embraced in our world, in my world of poetry set to music. It is a, it is a glorious evidence of America, not just African Americans of America. Langston Hughes is, is an American poet. And yes, he happened to be an African American. And, and my feeling is until we really get all of us up on that, 
on that plateau together, embracing that Americanness, regardless of our various tributaries that got us to that point, we have work to do. We have some heavy lifting to do. Um, and the other, the other thing that I do feel in this period is a new awareness to new music. Are you feeling that? Have you been feeling that before this particular meltdown? Are you, Missy, does it feel like, do you feel like maybe some of the colleagues before you that felt so isolated as new music musicians, composers, do you feel like there's somebody waiting to hear what else you've got to write? Sure. I, I yeah, I, um, I don't know what to yeah. say. I, yeah. 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 I, I feel like there's, it's hard to even imagine pre pandemic. I feel like it's been going on forever, but, um, it, yeah, I feel like there's a, a, a you know, a large opening up in certain, in some ways, uh, to new music, but at the same time, there are also still so many barriers and so much ridiculousness in 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 the scene and in the community and in, in institutions um, that I think I I love to see the dismantling of it. Um, so it's sort of like it goes it goes both ways, you know. Yeah, like I've um, you know had some amazing opportunities in the last couple of years, you know, I've been commissioned was, you know, one of the two first women to be commissioned by the Met. Um, but th when you look at the Met history as a whole, for example, you know, there's a lot of work that has to be done and a lot of voices that have been excluded. <laughs> you think? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for me to say like, to be really emphatic in either direction, you know? And I think that, um, as you know, speaking as, as a woman, I'm, I feel like I've, one of the skills I have is holding many realities in my mind at once. Um, and you know, I can be really, I mean, it was my dream to write for the Met. I've been dreaming of writing an opera for the Met since I was 15. Wow. And I feel like the intense joy and um, you know, satisfaction from that, it does not change the, my feelings about their history of excluding the voices of women, the voices of people who are not white. So, um, I feel many things about it. That's why I kind of don't, didn't know what to say. Cause it's like, there, there's an opening up in some directions and there's a closing down in other directions. And there's a sort of misguided opening up and then there's like great initiatives. And so it's a lot happening at once, but I'm, I'm embracing the sort of like openness that we have to looking at things more directly now than we ever have before. You know, there was a, a, a wonderful woman composer uh, that I knew very well, and I recorded a lot of her work. She was very, very popular in Los Angeles in the 40s, Eleanor Remick Warren. And she wrote some really quite beautiful cantatas, and, and Lawrence Tibbet had done some pieces. And I, and I, I knew her, and I, she actually gave me her, she was a wonderful pianist, and she was the actual go-to accompanist of the day for certainly Lawrence Tibbet and, 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 and Nelson Eddy and, uh, and John McCormick and, and you know, um, some of the other great lady singers as well, um, Alma Gluck and so forth. But she, she used to get quite irritated and, and she gave a couple of very famous interviews in where she rather demonstrably said, there is no gender in music. You agree? Well, what does... Oh female composers composition sound like like i guess if, if there if it if there was gender in music wouldn't we have to define what uh, what male music sounds like and what female music sounds like and i just don't know that that's possible like that's uh, I, how, about I this, how about this one welcome to pride month how about gay music <laughs> that sure how about ben britain well, I had a yeah, huge that sound like time. Ben Britton and Billy Budd, you know, oh, well, you know, Ian Forrester and all that. It was, of course, they had this enormous gay agenda for the, for the boat, you know. I said, bullshit. It's Melville. It's <laughs> darkness. It's bad life. It's, you know, I mean, I, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to have the conversation. What would it have sounded like if Ben and Ian Forrester were straight? And, and who gives it? I mean, it, but back to this gender in music, do, do you get tired being labeled a woman composer? Again, I, I'm of two minds of it about it. You know, it's like I, um, that is a huge part of who I am and how I, I identify. 
Um, and I think it's very important to, especially in early education, to be creating more opportunities for voices that have not been heard. Again, so, you know, voices that are not male and, and not white, you know, and so just creating, intentionally creating more space for that. So I'm, I'm about, you know, I run a program for young uh, female identifying non-binary and gender non-conforming composers in their teens. So that's that's very much like in our title is that that it's for that um, group of people. And um you know, but at the same time, yeah, I, I feel like I miss out on a lot of opportunities to speak about my work in a very, uh, in the way that I like, you know, because people are seeing it from a female perspective and Breaking the Waves was a perfect example. I think people um, saw that, I got a lot of questions about what what is it like to, as a woman, write a piece that's explicitly violent and sexual. And I'm like, well, I don't know what it's like <laughs> as a man. I don't really, I, I just, can we just talk about what the piece is about? Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 the African American canon. You know, I'm I'm going to sing a bunch of songs on the seventh of July, and and I w I wish that there would be no program notes. So, so at the end of it, you could sort of say, and by the way, did you know where these people came from, and do you know who they are? Because in terms of hearing and in terms of understanding text and understanding, you know, human dilemma, which is very much part of songs, it it, it of course the prism through which we work is important and the sociological function, but at the end of the day, it's the story of humanity, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And when you label someone as a woman composer, you're sort of taking that away from them um, or you're assuming things um, and you're not letting them lead with their humanity or their interests or their eccentricities, or their weirdness and obsessions. And, and, you know, I, I don't go around thinking I'm a woman, I'm a woman, I'm a woman. I go around thinking about all the state, you know, these like wild, crazy ideas about like how to illuminate parts of humanity that are hard to express through words. And how can I do that through sound? That is what I'm thinking about all day. That is what I wanna talk about, you know, all the time with people. And I think that the, the woman thing sometimes gets in the way um, in that people don't seem to be able to move beyond it sometimes. Are you, uh, uh, so guys, we talked about, you had, you how, how many operas have you written together? Can you We're, name them in the years? Name in the many years for the for our audience, please. Sure. <laughs> okay, so we started off with a uh, song from the uproar, which was 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, then we did uh, Breaking the Waves, which was 2016, Proving Up, which was 2018, uh, and then we're about to premiere The Listeners, which is uh, a a new opera for uh, your Norwegian National Opera and Opera Philadelphia uh, that will premiere in Norway um, this coming year, God willing. Uh, and then uh, Lincoln in the Bardo, which is uh, on the book. Lincoln books in the Bardo. Future. That is the, I mean, I just, I whooped and hollered when I saw that it was on some blog that you had been given the commission for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, we, we actually talked about that when we were in Glimmerglass and, and Francesca, uh, Frances yeah, Francesca, we said, yeah, buy the rights, go now, <laughs> quick, you know, uh, you know, would, what a, what a, what a glorious book and what a glorious project that will be. Royce, you won the Pulitzer, right? Yes. For what? For an opera called Angel's Bone um, with Du Yun. Um, and that was in 2017. So 2016 was a big year for me. I premiered my opera about JFK in Texas in March, April. And then, no, I'm sorry. I did Angel's Bone in January, JFK in March, April, and then Breaking the Waves in September. So it was a, a huge uh, year for my career, um, and, and breaking the ways was sort of the, the the explosion that happened at the at the end of that, and, and it was yeah, it, my my career has never been the same. <laughs> do you just do you write every day? Um, no, um, but okay. So I let's preface this by saying that uh, Bill Finn, the great uh, musical theater writer, uh, was one of my professors at NYU. And he said that anytime that you are actively thinking about your work, you are writing. So if you are walking down the street and engaged in thoughts, trying to think about how you're structuring a, a project, then you are writing. So do I sit and actively write a script every single day? No, I would say that I write most days, uh, but there are days when I need to go and hang out in a lake or you know, yeah. do, you, do you write like Joseph Campbell used to say that he used to sit down and, and you just have to write and let all that stuff slop out like, like bad milk until the cream shows up. Oh God. Yeah. yeah. Always, the most daunting thing is looking at a blank page. So if you, I find that if I just throw words there as garbage as they might be and then sculpt 
uh, then that's that's definitely the way to go. But if you just get things on the page, then it doesn't. It feels like your uphill battle is just a little. Uh, it's not so steep. <laughs> In, until email was invented, the, the smallest library of an existing artist in the world was going to be mine, the collection of letters. <laughs> Do you write every day, Missy? No, but I, I try to. Just date. That's the goal. You know, and I think even if, if, for me, if I'm able to even write for 15 minutes, then I'm, that it keeps me in the flow of things. There's a big difference between writing for zero minutes and writing for even 10, 15 minutes. Um, and so I try to at least do that, but it's, it's, it's very hard. It's, I don't, you know, pretend that I'm just like throwing out ideas all the time. You know, it, it, it's kind well, of like, very difficult thing. Do you like keep a notebook and do things like, ah, oh, that could work. Oh, that could, work. oh yeah. And, and it's just, you know, elements of this and elements of that. And oh, that could go that and that could go that way. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have several notebooks for different purposes, you know. And while I'm thinking of it, Tom, um, you didn't get to hear this because we added it for the Omaha presentation of Proving Up, but Missy set this old, this 19th century poem called Uncle Sam's Farm. Uncle, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it, I, and we, it opens Proving Up now, but it is essentially an art song uh, that has been newly composed for baritone. <laughs> and, why, and why am I hearing about this on live internet interview? Why, why is this not in my Dropbox? Well, well, it's it's also it's a very strange thing, you know, and um, it's it, it was designed to open the opera, um, but it was really a song that was written to encourage westward expansion. It was written in 1848, you know, that you know, as people were starting, they were trying to get, you know, I mean, there were a lot of people living out in the west, <laughs> but you know, they're trying to get uh, settlers, immigrants, to come and move and settle the west with uh, with white people. So. Um, the song, the song is weirdly sort of relevant. Um, it was very relevant after our last election. And I find that it's again, relevant now. And the chorus is, um, you know, come along, make no delay, come from every nation, come from every way. Our lands, they are broad enough, don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. And there's a line that's- um, Would you send this to me? Of course, it's, it's, it's in your Dropbox already. You just don't know. I, I, I promise you, I mean, this is, you know, that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here. Do you, I want to, I'm, we're going to have to draw this up and pretty soon, but you know, I've, I've had the enormous privilege of, of, of working with a lot of your colleagues. And, and I remember uh, uh, Royce, when we were working and we were thinking about maybe there was going to be a commissioning part of this whole project and, you know, all of that. And you sent me a, a, a list of young composers, half of which I didn't know. Uh, which was exciting. Are you guys all friends? I mean, I, oh, I, work, with Daniel, I work with Daniel Poor and Cordigliano and Jennifer Higdon and, you know, and Mark Adamo and, you know, they're just, and Terry O'Regan. I just did this opera in Houston. And, and what, what choral writing? Terry, I mean, I don't know if you know his choral writing, but I mean, my God in heaven, such unbelievably beautiful stuff. Very difficult to memorize, I must say. But are, do you guys communicate with one another? you composers of, of the age? Yeah, well, one of the first Zoom calls we had at the top of the pandemic was with Mark and John. Um, so yeah, there's an example right there. And um, we were very much a community. Um, like I, I took, Missy and I talk every day. I talk every day with David T. Little. Um, I can't wait to uh, to have a socially distanced uh, beer with Du Yun at some point over the next couple months. Um, uh, Ricky, I talk to all the time. Ricky oh, Ingram, Ricky's, Ricky's an angel. Ordinary. Um, I have a very dynamic and, and deep friendship with Mikhail Carlson, the Swedish composer. Um, I'm doing a lot of projects with him. Um, Paolo Pristini, um, I talk to all the time. I I love these people. They're just they're they're such a huge, huge, huge part of my life, our lives, and and we really need the community to lift us all up because it's it's hard. It is hard to make contemporary music. It's hard to make contemporary art. It's hard to be an artist. It's, uh, for, it's been hard to be an artist forever. Uh, and so you you need that community. You need the people who are are in the thick of it with you to, to sort of give you the the gumption to to keep going. And and and, and also it's you don't want to create art in a bubble. You want to be in dialogue with your colleagues so that you're you're really pushing boundaries and, and making beautiful statements that that feel valid and exciting and, and necessary. Missy, do you listen to music? Yeah. 
course. <laughs> what? What, am, what do I listen to? What do you like? Um, you know, I this is sort of always the cliche answer. My tastes run are all, all over the map. Um, That's not cliche. Know, what's that? That's not cliche. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've been uh, listening to it. Um, so give, us, give us an idea how wide that map can be. Yeah, well, um, I, yes, you, yesterday I listened to a bunch of um, panpipe music um, from the Andes, and then there also is a panpipe tradition in Africa, and I was sort of like listening to the similarities, finding similarities between the two, which is really interesting, um, and a lot of differences. And then, um, you know, a lot of like Beyonce, um, you know, Kendrick Lamar. Um, and and then I've been listening to, I've been studying the score of this opera by Brett Dean called Hamlet. It's Hamlet, the story maybe you've I've heard of. I've met him. <laughs> they want to do it in Munich and and I, I'm, I they want me to do The Father. I'm oh, like, wow. Oh. Uh, when, whenever they, and I said, in a heartbeat. I mean, wow, what a score. What it's a extraordinary. score. extraordinary. And, I, you know, and it's wild. Every page is a little work of art. You know, you know, you know the conductor, you know, Yanovsky, Vladimir Yurovsky, Yurovsky, who's the new music director of Munich? No. No. We need to make, we need to make that acquaintance happen. Yes, please. <laughs> he would love your music. He would love it. Um, so, Tom, just one last thing. You're, you were supposed to be doing a new opera right about now as well with Lauren Snowfer, right? You were supposed to be doing... You know, he's the girl with a pearl earring and we've delayed it. It'll come out and we'll do it in, in the winter of 22. Okay. Literally in February, March of 22, of 2022. Uh, a very exciting score. Uh, Stephen Wirt is a, is a young man. I've known him for many years. He was, I did a Da Ponte play uh, about Da Ponte and he wrote the incidental music for it. And I mean, he's a very incredibly talented guy um, and player and a very challenging score, a wonderful story for an opera. So I'm I'm glad they're gonna they're gonna delay it and and we'll we'll do it uh, we'll do it a year yeah I've had a wonderful run I mean the last did, did, last season I had you know Rufus Wainwright's new opera uh, Hadrian which was incredibly powerful stuff I think we won the Canadian Opera Award so we won something and we lost something I don't know <laughs> uh, and uh, or didn't get it I don't know but um, and then Terry O'Regan and uh, John Caird's uh, Da Ponte bio in Houston which. I would like to see, and Luca Pizzaroni, my son-in-law, was just an absolute miracle in the piece. He was the, he was the young da Ponte, and I was rather long in the tooth da Ponte. Um, and, but it was a wonderful story. And one of, we need to do a, I'd love to see some sort of theatrical condensation of that piece. And, and that was a lot of fun. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we just have to get opera, uh, you know, back up on its feet and, and, and the arts back. I think there's more chance of that in Europe, quite frankly. Um, it, okay. I have the rather depressing feeling that the arts world has been decimated by the double whammy of, of coronavirus mishandled and economic meltdown equally mishandled, in my opinion. Um, we'll see. Uh, the bringing, the, the unfortunate America, the bringing back to the arts to the public is going to be completely contingent upon ticket sales. And, and when we're going to have 4,000 people that want to go back to the opera house and sit next to one another again at the Met, it's going to be a while. So it's a, it's a different equation. Um, and, and regardless of all that nonsense, uh, and it isn't nonsense, I, I should say, but my focus is, is on the conversation that's now happening as we reopen. The first question is, what is vitally important for people to have first? And if that doesn't quickly go to some conversation to the arts and humanities or liberal arts education, I think we're in a lot of, we're going to lose a lot of ground and we're in a lot of trouble. We've already dismantled liberal arts education and public administration, public education in America. Uh, uh, and it would be, it would be a horrific uh, tide of events if we allowed that to be completed, not just with this administration, but with the general prevailing attitude towards intellectual personal achievement which is as exciting and valid as any football that's being thrown. Reminds me of Lenny and all of his wonderful pieces and that wonderful sarcasm that he could have. But I, I, th I just think that we as artists have to, and that's part of this pre, you know, July 4 and having you two who are just absolute cutting edge and represent the most exciting development that we can possibly have in front of us. 
and 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 give us some confidence that that the future of creating music and creating theatrical pieces that are relevant and meaningful and interesting and god forbid entertaining uh uh is secure and i thank you from my thank heart you. Thank my you. goodness this has been such a pleasure tom i hope we get to uh give you a big hug in person very soon <laughs> Not, not that soon, but, you know. <laughs> Give my mask. No, oh, there we, we got to go. Reminds me of a wonderful story. Of, talk about hypochondria. Glenn Gould and Michael Tilson Thomas are having a conversation. Glenn is in Toronto. Michael is in New York. At some point, Michael sneezes. Glenn hungs up and uh, would not answer the phone for a week. <laughs> 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 so, all right. Uh, God bless the internet. Anyway, what, what a wonderful conversation. Godspeed. Right, 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 right. And um, if you need an old baritone who's still got some chops, let me know. Always. Send me that song. <laughs> we, we will. We will. We adore you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> what, what's instrumentally going on with you right now, Missy? What have you? Are you doing another symphony or a string quartet or or yada yada? yada? Um, you know, yeah, so finishing the opera and then before I start the next opera, I'm going to write a violin concerto and a percussion quartet. And I've been writing, you know, in, in the quarantine, writing a lot of stuff for myself to play on piano and electronics. Which is wonderful. Yeah. Why don't you write a wonderful percussion piece for Martin Grubinger? Do you know this guy? No. <gasps> I've got to get you with Martin Grubinger. Oh, my God. You would love each other. Oh, my God. You've never. Oh, my God. He does things. He is. He's. He's. He's a kind of Mozart of, of today. He's amazing. It doesn't compose. That's not about it. That's a wrong analogy. But he's a child prodigy, genius percussionist, and also you know. Oh my God! Go to go to YouTube. Look up Martin Grubinger. Got we'll it. do. You're gonna go nuts and write him something. <laughs> he would love it. Great. We'll do. Oh, you guys are great. I gotta go. You got to go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. We could go on for another hour, but we're not going to. Uh, check out the playlist below. Uh, and when you look at the music and you love Miss Mazzoli's work. By the way, do you say, somebody correct me. How do you say your name? I, I, you have the American pronunciation, which is Mazzoli. But it's, you know, it's Mazzoli. <laughs> in the, in the old country. It's Mazzoli. Yeah. Not Mazzoli, but Mazzoli? Yes. And did you grow up speaking Italian? No, <laughs> no, no, I'm like fourth generation American. I'm American through and through. But you like pizza? Yeah. Who doesn't like okay. pizza? Okay. Come I'm a on. sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, check out the playlist. Check out Miss Mazzoli's music. Find anything you can that Mr. Mr. Uh, Vavrick has written. Uh, and there's a few songs on there that are a little unusual, perhaps, as you think of our Independence Day in America. Uh, everything from Langston Hughes to Walt Whitman to Margaret Bonds to Richard Danielpour to John Cordiano. Uh, music is in good hands. All we have to do is listen, pay attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>